It's my privilege to introduce um, our speaker today, Tim Maloney. The program title is 365 Days of Amazing Color. Tim Maloney has spent the last 18 years working as a lead landscape designer and landscape sales manager for Rost Incorporated in Columbia, Missouri. He began teaching at MU in 2008, became full-time faculty member in the horticulture and ornamental design department in 2014. He instructs master gardeners in the use of perennials through MU Extension. During this time, he thoroughly researched the ins and outs of landscape design, build industry, and diligently worked at learning what to, and more importantly, what not to help ensure a successful career in the landscape industry. His hope is that he can pass along all that he has learned through the School of Hard Knocks and practical experience to the next generation of landscape designers and the general public. There you go. So without further ado, here's Tim. All right, thank you very much, Lynn. Yeah, um, I always emphasize the learning what not to do because that, that seemed to help me far more than learning you know, what to do along the way. And I'm passing some of that on. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure they'll make a lot of the mistakes on their own along the way. So today we're talking about um, you know, 365 days of amazing, right? So that's what we're going for. You know, that's what I try to do when I'm when I'm designing uh, for my clients, and that is to to get a landscape that um, actually looks good with the word. You know, May 15th or, or July 15th or uh, maybe even September or January 15th, if we can pull it off. I don't want people to, you know, uh, have to too anxiously await uh, the spring season for their landscape to start looking good, their gardens to start looking good. Uh, so, you know, what it boils down to is, is people absolutely love color. They're excited by color. Uh, Got to, I have to relay um, an interesting situation for, for a very recent design that I worked on. Uh, we did the front yard, um, the front landscape design uh, about two years ago, and everything is looking fantastic. And one of the emphasis that the client, my client wanted was a lot of color. And that was specific, we wanted a lot of color. Um, in the landscape. And, you know, I thought I'd done a really, really good job of that. And, uh, and then uh, we started to work on the pool area. They got a pool put in last summer and they're ready for, to, to go this week, uh, this summer. And so uh, revisited the landscape. And, and one thing that again was, was reemphasized that, that she wanted even more color than what we put around in front. Um, and, you know, an obscene amount of color, I think is what she was going for. So rather than, you know, getting us to the obscene level and stopping, I went over it, you know, and I told her we were going to end up with rainbow, you know, rainbows and, and Skittles all over the landscape if we weren't careful, but that's what she was going for. And, and we're very excited by color. Um, you know, you, you know if, you, if you think about that, color absolutely sells. It's something that we love. And the thing is, plants could care less, really. They could not care any less whatsoever about how excited we get about color. Uh, people are not in, in their thought process. If they had a thought process, they would not care. They have a far deeper, more meaningful purpose uh, for the color that is in that they display all the time. And it, and it boils down to very simply, pollinators are also excited by color. Okay, With pollinators being excited by color, um, it helps to perpetuate their species. And that's what, that's exactly what is, you know, necessary. Um, there's really, there is no conscious thought with plants. Um, we, we like to believe there is, um, but the fact of the matter is that plants exist to exist. They exist to exist. Their purpose is to reproduce and perpetuate the species. And they use color to do that. Um, basically, um, it is a sexual reproduction um, and they require pollen to be spread from male flowers to female flowers. Or in case of some plants, those are on you know separate plants. In other cases, it's right in the same, same plant itself. 
Um, but color excites our insects, you know, it excites the bees, it excites the butterflies, it even excites the birds as well, right? So uh, the plant needs our, our pleasure. That's what we're looking for here. The plants require color. The plants absolutely require color to perpetuate their species. That's it. Um, they are trying to attract the birds and the bees and the butterflies, all the pollinators that we, you know, we plant gardens specifically uh, full of color for the pollinators. And by doing so, we are helping the plant perpetuate its, you know, its species on that. Now, another thing to be very cognizant of is the fact that, um, by the way, uh, plunkers, beware, and I'm a baseball person, so this is what a lot of folks in my circle think plunking looks like, uh, retaliation, you know, to a hitter, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about the indiscriminate purchase and planting of plants without any real thought or, you know, um, design whatsoever. That is what plunking is in my, my world, is um, you walk into a, a garden center on um, this time of year, you're tired of winter, everything has been gray for so long, and, and everything's starting to wake up and come alive, and we get excited, <clears throat> go to our garden center, right? And when we do, I just want you all to know that the folks at that garden center are well aware of our color-centric tendencies. Okay. They're very aware of what they need to place in front of you to bait the hook, so to speak. Okay, They are looking for you when you are looking for an escape. Okay, You're escaping winter. You're escaping the harsh months. Maybe even you're escaping summer, you know, and you're coming in in the fall season, and you're really wanting to look for that fall, that fall color again after a long, harsh summer. Retailers are aware of this, okay? and they do a very good job of positioning, you know, the most attractive plants in front of us, right, when it's time for us to shop, when it is immersed in bloom, okay, and we walk in and we're all excited about this new plant we see on display, it's a proven winner or something cool like that, and it's absolutely gorgeous because it's fresh and it's new. And we don't care how big it gets. We don't care what kind of sun it needs. We don't care what kind of soil it needs. We are going to buy that plant and we are going to put it in the ground and we are going to make it work because we are gardeners and that's what we do. That's it. Okay. We're going to make it happen. We are so excited by the color of this plant that we are going to put it in the ground and make sure we benefit from the beauty of this plant. Okay. We fill our gardens with all the available color, okay? And I am talking to a group full of gardeners, okay? I'm not talking to a group full of landscapers. That's something a little bit different we'll talk about here coming up. There is a, a strong difference between a landscape and a garden, okay? Um, but we'll discuss that a little bit further. But we are gardeners. You are, I am a gardener. Um, and we like to play in our yards. Okay, that's exactly it. It's our escape. It's our, if it's not our vocation, it is our, you know, relaxation. It is our hobby, whatever you want to call it. And we love to fill our gardens with all the available color. Okay? We have some issues with that, however. Um, as gardeners, we tend to be somewhat herbaceous stemmed centric. In other words, we tend to lean toward the herbaceous perennials because we have learned that the herbaceous perennials do a fantastic job of providing us with some fantastic bloom. Okay? So I'm going to give a little bit of love to the woody stem plants in this presentation uh, because I have seen far too many gardener gardens that are far too herbaceous centric and they tend to leave us with nothing to enjoy during what I call the sleepy months or the harsher months, okay? And so what I'm looking at is um, the harshest of the months in the winter months here in, in the central part of the United States. And then the summer months can be also very brutal and a bit of a gap in our color. So today I'm going to be looking pretty heavily at ways to bridge that gap. And I'm going to focus a lot on woody stemmed materials, okay? Uh, let's see, before I move to the next slide, have we had any questions yet, Lynn? 
No questions yet. All right. Feel free to chime in whenever you have any or if you might have some. All right. So next up, we're looking at this. Okay. The fact of the matter is I'm not here today to tell you that your herbaceous centric garden is by any stretch of the imagination wrong. That's not the right term like that. It is not wrong. In fact, um, it's lovely. It's absolutely fantastic. And it's nothing less than what I would expect. Really. Um, we enjoy the bloom from the herbaceous stemmed plants. And we should actually design our gardens to be most beautiful when we will, when they will be most enjoyed. Okay. When we are living, and I'm, I'm not saying visiting, but when we are living, living in our gardens, okay, that is when we wish for them to be the most beautiful. Okay. Um, we typically, however, like to spend time living in our gardens during the more moderate weather months, okay? Spring is the first one that comes to mind. And when we compare that to summer, okay? I don't know about you, but a lot of times um, I am excited about spending time in my garden in the spring of the year um, because it's, it's starting to warm up. It's no longer miserably cold. It's starting to green up. Um, things are popping, but I actually take a tour every morning now um, through my garden before I go anywhere else just to see what is about to bloom what doesn't look like it's going to bloom like I'd like it to, what the uh, local pests and rabbits and deer and all that have decided to take a uh, liking to in my garden. Um, I love that time of year, but I am not a huge fan of doing so during the summer months. Uh, late June, July, August are a little bit brutal um, as far as temperature is concerned. And I am, by the way, a sweater. I'm not talking about Angora or I'm talking about profusely leaking fluids from the pores in my skin when it gets super warm. I do that a lot. Um, I am definitely known to go through a shirt or two during a day. And so it is, for me, a less enjoyable time to try to live in my garden. Okay, So my garden might be a little bit more of the spring. And I also, I like it. I like fall. I really do. I'm not a big fan of winter overall, other than I do like changing, you know, seasons, but I like to live in the gardens and be outside in the fall. Um, it is a reprieve for me from the summer heat, and it is a time when you can see that things are going to start to rest. Uh, the leaves are changing color and they're falling off and the blooms are, are you know, lessening, um, and we start to look for other things to find interest in and there. Okay, so I want you to design your garden around the times you wish to enjoy it, not the times that I wish to enjoy mine. I've already done that with my garden. I've designed it for the times that I want to be out there, okay? I want you to understand that it is okay for you to put plants into the, you know, into your garden, into your design that you will enjoy when you are out there to enjoy it, all right? All right. I want you to also, by the way, design your garden to increase the time that you enjoy it. Um, if you can figure out a way to moderate the temperature um, and extend your fall living into the early winter um, with portable heaters or things like that, and maybe even start using it a little bit earlier in the spring the same way, please do so. If you can add lighting to your landscape or to your garden to allow you to be out there in the evening it will extend the amount of time that you can be in and enjoy that garden into the summer, okay? I find um, when the sun is about to go down in the summer to be the most enjoyable time for me of those summer months, either early in the morning before the sun has gotten up and fully baked, you know, the oven, turn the oven on, or maybe um, in the evening when it's starting to shut off a little bit. That's when I enjoy being outside in the summer. So I design our garden with lighting and plants of the appropriate bloom color to be enjoyed at that time. I, I'm talking about designing your garden to increase the time you'll enjoy it, designing your garden around the times you wish to enjoy it, and design your entire landscape with each little garden area in it for both. Okay, you want to design your landscape to both enjoy it in the times that you like and to increase that amount of time as long as possible. Okay. All right. 
what is the difference between gardens and landscapes? Okay. Basically, and this is and this is not, you're not going to find this in Webster. If you Google what's the difference between gardens and landscape, this is just an, an old guy that's been designing landscapes for people for a very long time. And I design landscapes for gardeners as well. Okay. Gardener, gardens focus on growing and tending to plants. Growing and tending to plants. That's what a garden is, whether it's a vegetable garden, a flower garden, a cutting garden, a pollinator garden, a bird garden, a wildlife garden. It is The focus is for you to grow and tend to those plants. You are meant to be involved with your garden. It is a dynamic thing. A garden changes as the seasons progress. And a gardener has to anticipate these changes and work with these changes and tend to the plants in there and understand that some plants will grow and crowd out other plants and those will maybe need to be removed or, or thinned out. And you understand that these plants will bloom now and these will bloom later. And that we time this symphony to provide the color when we want it to, okay? Landscapes focus on providing the shape. Okay? They provide the shapes upon which we garden. And we garden in wildly varying degrees, okay? So I can design your landscape with areas for in which you will garden, okay? And that's, that's what I do. I do not design gardens. I design landscapes with gardens in them. Okay, and those and those vary from people to people. Believe it or not, I, I design a lot of landscapes for people who are not gardeners. And the purpose of their landscape is for them to enjoy it. They do not wish to interact with it as much as a gardener does. And so understanding that difference as a designer has helped me quite a bit along the way. When I design a landscape for a non-gardener, it's something that they can be in, can be enjoyed multi-seasonally. I want them to be able to, from inside or outside, as they drive past or pull into the driveway, I want them to be able to enjoy that garden, 300, or that landscape, 365 days a year. Okay, that's my purpose. I want something for them to be proud of, something that is aesthetically attractive year round. Okay, for a gardener, I allow the same things to happen. Okay, the landscape for which they will build their garden is also and should also be designed for 365 days of viewing, okay? The gardens within that landscape, however, can explode and retract and climax and retreat at different times of the year, um, just to provide even more interest and more dynamic color changes, okay? All right, so what we wanna do is we want to design to bridge the gaps, okay? We are designing to bridge those gaps. We are looking at our landscape, our garden, and we are trying to identify our color needs. We go out and we take a look, okay? We analyze what we actually have. And what we start with is we need to look at our landscape, look at our garden at the times when we don't typically look at it, okay? What does it look like when we're not excited to be in it? What does it look like when it's not as attractive as the times when we're spent, when we're living in it, okay? So I want you to take a strong look at what that looks like. You know, if you find beauty in this, which by the way, I do, that is great, but others see a lot of gray, maybe a little green, okay? Do you have room to add color? to your garden at the times when it no, when it's not flourishing, when it doesn't have a lot of color, okay? Is there room in there? And I'm, I know I'm speaking to a lot of gardeners who understand or they feel as though that they cannot allow an empty space between plants. Trust me, I know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. If I see a place that could hold a plant, I wanna put it in there. Um, that's the gardener in me. The landscape designer in me understands that some empty is okay. And it is, I'm telling you that too. Some empty is okay. But for the, but honestly, some of you may not have currently any room in your garden to add color. You know, you've you had color earlier. You'll have color later. You don't have color there right now. But the plants that are in there occupying that space may provide color earlier or later. So you have to really analyze and evaluate what your garden looks like, okay? 
can you, you know, make room for color? Is there something that um, maybe you're a little tired of, you know? Um, is there is there a way to to dig some things up, move some things around, you know, take it to the next master gardener meeting and, and give it to somebody else who wants it, something like that. Maybe it's a little bit bigger job. Maybe the shovel won't cut it. Maybe you have to bring in a backhoe to provide that room for color. But whatever it is, you know, can you make room to add the color. And this is the part where you have to be really honest with yourself is, are you completely happy with that? You gotta make some hard choices, okay? This is, Con I don't know if you know about Con, Con Marie, but basically this is a, a design, um, oh, it's, a, it's a, ton, a design concept in which you look at or you hold an object. You look at an object or you hold an object and, and you ask yourself, does it bring you joy? This is a simplification process. Okay. Does it bring you joy? And if it does not bring you joy, then you need to evaluate whether or not it needs to be there. The, the, using Con Marie, um, basically the, the, the answer is no. If it doesn't bring your joy, it does not need to be there. Okay. So you, you minimize it. You take it out. Okay. Um, so if, if you love that plant that is in your garden, and when you look at it, when you touch it, when you smell it, when you see the, the butterflies dancing around it, if it provides you joy, then by all means, you leave it there, okay? And you work around it, okay? But you cannot be afraid of change. And, and this is, this is I, I, gotta, I gotta show you this. So I am a, a landscape designer. And one of the hardest things for a landscape designer is to design their own property, okay? And I... <sighs> I tell folks all the time that a, a good landscape design uh, needs to be updated, renovated, overhauled, so to speak, every 15-ish years. And some of these images that you're about to see are actually at year 17 for a, a lot of my landscape. And, and you can tell, you know, landscapes and gardens are dynamic and you have to take a hard look. And even though I was still, um, clinging to the original design concept, I had to come to grips with the fact that some things were not right. Okay, I had, you know, some beautiful viburnums that were now being swallowed by the spreading base of the Norway spruce, which was not going to leave the landscape. Um, I had um, some issues with some fungus that were attacking some of my copertina. Um, well, no, these are actually Diablo um, nine bark that were in there. I had, um, virus, viral roses that were coming through. And these provided so much summer color for me and places, but I had the rose rosette virus coming in. And then I had, you know, um, a, an issue with some freezing and some cracking and took out a beautiful Southern Magnolia. So it was time to change. It was time to change. And there were a couple of reasons why I was, I was afraid of change. One is, like I said, I was clinging to that original concept and, and in denial of the fact that it had already been 17 years in place. And the other thing that I was afraid of was understanding the fact that this was about to become a very large chunk of money um, out of my, uh, our personal funds, uh, but it was something that was absolutely necessary. And it was time to take some stuff out. You know, it's not a steel advertisement. It is more of a metaphor for, um, it was time. It was time for some harsh realities of change in there. It's time for the removes. So, and once we remove it, and we got it all cleared out and, and this is it. You know, this is stripped and it's ready. And if you look in here at all of these wonderful spaces that we see, um, it's time. It was time for a redesign. It was time to go through and fill these areas that were once occupied by other plants. And see, I, you know, you do this evaluation and you rip out the parts of the garden that you were no longer happy with and you decide, okay, what do I need to put back in there to make me happy? Well, this time maybe will make me happier than what I had last time, you know? So that's that's all, you know, part of this as well. Um, so what do we do after it's gone? Well, we look at each area individually. Once again, the rose, you know, the viburnum are gone, the, the nine bark are gone, the roses are gone, um, the magnolia is gone, okay? So then it's time to choose our plants. Okay, we start with our gap seasons and we pick plants to bridge those gaps, okay? So I look at first when I'm designing 
for you or for myself or for anyone, I look at the harshest months first. Okay? Spring and fall are just super easy. I'm not going to lie. It is really easy to design a spring or fall centric landscape. But I want those gaps between spring and fall, summer, between fall and spring, winter, to be full of color as well. And I, and I want to expand also the thought process behind the word color and maybe expand that to also be interest, you know, in there, um, especially when we get into winter, um, interest is as important as color. So I look at bloom and beyond, okay? Summer color, we look at bloom, you know? Uh, what plants do we have that bloom well in the summer, okay? Um, we can look at the crepe myrtle, um, if we have a lot of sun, or the butterfly bush, and, you know, in the sun. Or we can look at, um, and again, I'm, keep in mind, I'm for a reason here, I'm, I'm pretty woody stemmed heavy on this. The hydrangeas are a fantastic choice, all, all of them. You know, we've got the, the endless summers and the blues and pinks, and then we've got the oak leaf, or we've got the uh, smooth hydrangeas, if we want to be a little bit more native. We can look at trees, like the seven sunflower, but we have blooming options in the summer. And I will actually start there. I have found that if I start with summer bloom and then fill in the gaps with other plants, those other plants almost always typically have spring bloom. And so I don't have to really worry about a bloom gap going on. Hey, this is a, that's just a close up of that seven suns flower right in there. It's a fantastic tree we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Okay? Um, roses, obviously. I have, honestly, I've got to tell you straight, um, I have, we're dealing so, I would say rosette virus has become, the rose rosette virus has become such an issue in our area that I have probably reduced the use of, of roses in landscapes and gardens to almost nothing, probably down to about, you know, 10% of what I did in previous years. So, and it's just a shame because there's <laughs> there's very few plants that bridge a color gap like roses. Um, when they start blooming in, in May and don't stop blooming until November, it was it was a pretty, no you know, kind of a no brainer on using them. But we can also look beyond bloom uh, for our color and into the foliage, you know, with things like the uh, tiger eye sumac or uh, may, you name the barbarous, right? The barberry, um, any of those um, provide a lot of foliage color. Um, the lowly spirea that everybody seems to think is, is an, you know, kind of a afterthought or a not thought at all in the landscape just because they're so common, but they provide such good foliage color. Nobody forgets about the Japanese maples, whether they be red or green. And then we've got like we talked about earlier, the nine bark or maybe even some you know ornamental grasses like with the um, little blue stem that you see here, but we have foliage options as well. So beyond bloom, we can go into foliage and beyond foliage, we can look at fruit as well. Fantastic options in summer fruit. Um, we can look at, um, this is, you know, after the crabapple spring bloom, the crabapple can be loaded with absolutely beautiful red fruit. Um, this is, by the way, that nine bark tree that I showed you earlier in the white bloom. This is actually its fruit. And some would argue, me being one of those some, that it's actually more beautiful in fruit than it is in bloom. Uh, we have the beauty berry, you know, the calicarpa coming in there, whether you use the purple or, uh, let's see, the purple beauty berry or the, oh, that's the other one, the common beauty berry. Um, and then we have the, ah, oh, that is uh, the fruit of the button bush coming in, white bloom in the spring, but then the fruit comes on late in the summer. Um, and then what about even, you know, thinking beyond um, the bloom and, and going into even edibles? Um, one of the things that I found, you know, um, I got kind of tired of the, you know, quote unquote, wisteria uh, trellis or the clematis. And, and we did a pergola um, for a family that absolutely um, loved this concept. And they, and they benefit from it all the time. And that is a grape barber. So on their pergola over their patio, they actually have grapes growing on there. And the clusters of fruit that hang down are beautiful. Um, they have to be a little bit mindful of the birds, you know, that come in um, and, and steal that fruit and, and leave their droppings. Uh, but it has um, some really bit awesome visual 
interest plus uh, they can pick and eat the grapes if they would like you know so that's right and then from summer we're skipping over fall right and we're going into winter because it's the other harsh month but what about bloom in the winter yep, i said it bloom in the winter um this one is probably the most obvious um and again i'm talking woody stem stuff here there's a lot of herbaceous perennials that come up real early but you cannot really beat the witch hazel uh, for winter bloom. Okay, the winter blooming witch hazel is a fantastic plant. Um, I love it for a couple of reasons. One is um, it wakes me up. It re it reminds me that uh, winter will end. Okay, winter will end, and spring is on its way. The other reason I like it is because it, it blooms at a tough time. Okay. It blooms at a time when there's not a lot of things out there to pollinate it. It blooms at a time um, when there's nothing else to see. And I, and I kind of like the, the showboat element of that. And I, will lo I love putting witch hazels in people's gardens and landscape. And then we go quickly <laughs> out of bloom and into foliage. Okay, uh, But we can look at things like the Mahonia or the Oregon Great Poly for its winter color. Um, this is the little blue stem in the winter. And I think a lot of people seriously overlook our grasses for winter interest and winter color. Uh, we have Nandina. We'll talk about that. You know, it's an evergreen. And it's, this is a um, rhododendron, you know, that comes in there. Um, and it turns this really cool bronze color in the fall and that persists as an evergreen all winter. And then of course you can't escape the conifers, right? Um, I think beyond green uh, when you're going with the color and that, you know, to the blues and the golds that also show up in the conifers. And it, it's kind of funny, you know, that lady I was telling you about early on, that client, I, I tongue in cheek kind of remind her that green actually is a color. And she has a lot of that, but uh, uh, she's, again, she wants rainbows and Skittles throughout her landscape. So we're, we're in the process of making that happen, okay? And then we can go beyond bloom foliage um, and even a little bit beyond color and more about the interest here, but what about bark? You know, that is uh, the, the bark of the crepe myrtle tree right there, which, you know, doesn't work real well in, in parts of our region to get that large, but also the seven suns flower has a very similar bark to that. The river birch, which I have been accused of and will uh, gladly admit to overusing, um, is a fantastic winter interest plant with its bark. Um, this is the bark of the Parvifolia elm, the lace bark elm. Absolutely beautiful in the wintertime with that flaky, scaly bark going on. Or we can go into the paper bark maple um, on that. Same kind of thing. Just gorgeous gold and bronze coloring of that bark. And then uh, the curia, the Japanese curia, and there with its beautiful green stems, or how about the flame willows or the red osier dogwoods that you see there? These are all wonderful stem colored or bark colored plants that provide more than just interest, but even color in the landscape. Right? How about fruit? How about fruit in the winter, okay? This is the snowberry bush, absolutely love this plant. And they even have snowberry in pink. I'm not sure I would continue to call it snowberry because I'm not sure what's been spilled on that snow, uh, but it is still an absolutely gorgeous plant. I actually just recently added snowberry into my landscape, the white one, not the pink one. And I, abs I loved what it did late fall and into the winter with its fruit. Um, cannot talk about fruit in the winter and the color without discussing verticillata, the winterberry holly. Um, it's, it's a really good plant. Um, looking at the sumac and the, and the red fruit that's on that. Um, and then this is the pyracantha, you know, in there. Um, so we have wonderful options for adding color in our harsher months using some woody stem plants. And there's another benefit to the woody stem plants that I think a lot of people may, a lot of gardeners may be afraid to admit, and that is the fact that they are a little bit more self-sufficient and a little bit less maintenance, you know, required and in, involved there. Um, and so by, you know, putting a little bit less input into them, they kind of provide that skeleton for our gardens um, to build upon, okay? So we can build our herbaceous gardens around a skeleton of woody stem plants. And those woody stem plants can carry a heavy load of, you know, providing a little bit more color along the way for us to utilize 
in the months when our herbies aren't doing quite as well. Okay, so then we, we come up with this list of plants that we want to use and we revisit our design and we start putting symbols in and labeling those symbols and adding some color to our landscape and to our gardens um, to use in a furniture. But I love the thought we got to put it on paper. Okay, put it on paper. So I'm reminded, okay, when I go to the garden center, this is my recipe, this is my shopping list, this is what I want to do. All right. So this is Maloney's top 10 list. All right. So, you know, we, we, you know, we've got Dick Clark there and his top list. This is, this is my top 10 summer co color plants list. And again, I am, I am definitely leaning toward the woody stems on this. Not, uh, not, not I'm not even going to apologize for it. Um, because I'm talking to a room full of folks that know their herbaceous plants. Okay. So let's look at the top 10 summer plants. We're going to start with Nandina, move to Tiger Eye Sumac, Low Skate Mound Chokeberry, uh, Endless Summer Hydrangea, Orange Rocket Barberry, Little Blue Stem, that's a grass, Butterfly Bush, Purple or American Beauty Berry, Oak Leaf Hydrangea, and Seven Suns Flower. Now we're going to go through each one of these in order from one to ten. I'm in more detail and provide pictures and, and stuff like that, but I will give you a few minutes if you would like to write that list down, I will allow you to do so. And then we can, you can take notes on each one as we go, right? So I'll give you a few minutes to write down one through 10 of Maloney's top 10 summer color plants. There is a very good chance, I'd say I mean, 85 to 100% chance that one, well, no, I'm not even gonna say that. Uh, there's a 100% chance that one of these plants will make it into almost every landscape design that I draw. 100% chance at least one of them. There is a probably 85 to 95% chance that multiple of these plants end up in the same design. Okay, so we got that. Now, so let's move on and we'll we'll talk about the seven suns flower first. Okay. First Can of I all, ask, yes. Excuse me, there was one more question. Yeah. What was the willow with the winter bark color? That's the flame ammer willow. Uh, ammer flame or flame ammer willow. Um, it is a it is a woody stem shrub uh, that has a brilliant orange bark to it in the wintertime. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of comment. It didn't, it's, it's probably not, uh, it used to be on one of my favorite winter lists, but then, you know, how you have, you have your kids, you know, and, and you love them to death. It's kind of like my plants here. I love them to death, but they misbehave sometimes. You have to be very mindful. Uh, it is a willow by all sense of its definition, and it has a tendency to reach well beyond where we plant it. So be, be mindful of that flame willow. Um, it's a beautiful winter interest, but you have to put it in a place um, where it can either be somewhat imprisoned, so to speak, or you have to be conscious of the fact that it's not going to stay put. Okay. So we'll move into the seven sun flower here. This is Heptacodium myconioides. It's a fun one to say, Heptacodium myconioides. Uh, this, hands down, without a doubt, uh, I think second to none is the most underused ornamental tree in the landscape and in the gardens. What you see is a uh, lower left photo there is a, is a close up of the bloom. And that's actually where it gets its name, seven suns flower, the seven suns our seven sun. There are seven individual flowers um, in each cluster of flower, which, you know, that's where it gets that in there. I um, mean, it blooms uh, basically in August, early September is when it blooms. And it's the white bloom that you see there. And it's an absolutely gorgeous, large leaf plant, okay, on that. And then the fruit shows up about a few weeks after the blooming is done. So in you know, basically October. And that's what you see on that picture to the right. It is prolific in fruit. And that is absolutely gorgeous. It's this melon colored fruit that has, well, I should say it's a fruit that has these melon colored sepals around the outside. Um, it is in the Caprifoliaceae family, uh, which is in the same family as Wy Wygela is in there. Um, Let's see what else. Deer Villa is in that family. Actually, Viburnum used to be in that family. And then uh, through genetics and, and a little bit more knowledge, they've moved into their own um, 
family now. Um, this is actually a native to China plant. Um, it is a zone five to nine hardy. It, it gets up to about 20 feet tall with a spread of about 10, I'd say maybe even 12 feet. Um, again, the bloom is, is white with a pinkish colored calyx in there. A full sun plant for sure. Not hard to take care of. Um, it's great as a flowering accent tree, very showy. It's also fragrant. Hummingbirds absolutely love this plant. So do butterflies, showy fruit, um, without a doubt. It's also a multi-seasonal plant. Like I said, we have the summer bloom. We have the fall fruit on there. And then the winter interest of the bark is absolutely amazing. It reminds me, like I said earlier, of a great myrtle tree um, in the South, when, you know, when it's gotten large and, and can have that kind of flaky white colored bark. Absolutely beautiful plant. And I will, I will warn you, there is a downside to this plant as I, I found that they have, are very expensive. They're not readily available in all garden centers. Um, and they are a relatively expensive plant, but you can order them. Um, again, it is well worth it. Um, but it's, they're actually in the first uh, rendition of the Maloney Garden, Seven Sunflower did not exist. Um, it exists in two locations in the newly updated and revised Maloney Garden. So this one is personal favorite and used personally in, in my own garden and enjoying every minute of it. So there you have it, the Seven Sunflower. Moving on to number two, and this one has been a, one of my favorites for a very long time, and that is the oak leaf hydrangea. Uh, this is the hydrangea quercifolia. It gets its quercifolia because the genetic name of the oak is quercus, and so it has quercifolia on there. Um, this is a deciduous shrub. It's in the hydrangea, hydrangea ACA family. It is native actually to the southeastern United States. It is not a Missouri or Kansas native. Um, it is a zone five to nine hardy. It's six to eight foot tall, six to eight foot spread, depending on um, if you're going with the cultivars or not. Your typical species plant is a large shrub like you see there, but there are options that are a little smaller. Snow Queen probably tops out at six by six. Um, Sykes Dwarf tops out at about four by four, and there's probably even some newer ones now that are even smaller in there. Um, this is a fantastic plant. Uh, the summer look that you see right up there is um, you know, the May through July look. That is the white bloom. And then that white bloom transitions to a kind of a bronzy crimson color that you see in that kind of lower right uh, image. And then uh, basically then when the blooms turn paper, or sorry, the blooms will turn paper brown, about the same time the leaves turn crimson red and it is a wonderful multi-season plant. And to be honest, I'm actually a pretty big fan of this plant in the wintertime. It's got a great coarse texture and real architectural slash structural branching formation to it. Um, so even when the leaves fall off this plant still, I think contributes to the garden. Uh, those flowers, by the way, are excellent cut. Um, they're excellent dried and cut and they're excellent dried and left on the plant in the garden. So you've got a lot of options on that. But this, you know, the oak leaf hydrangea, uh, above all other hydrangeas, is probably my favorite to use in the garden. It does require afternoon shade, protection from afternoon sun. Then you have a question? Yes. Um, can you speak to deer, rabbit, pest yeah. resistance on all yeah. of these? Absolutely um, can. Top 10? Yeah. Uh, first of all, they don't make a top 10 list for Maloney unless they're deer and rabbit resistant. Unfortunately, we have uh, in Boone County, where I live and work, we have what I call the domesticated deer. Uh, there are too many deer all over the place and not, not enough thinning of the herd, so to speak. And so I tend, I've seen far too much revenue lost over the years to deer and rabbit are kind of in that same category. And so everything on here so far is deer resistant. Now that does not mean the deer won't give it a try. It just means hopefully they don't continue to eat it. Um, and so what I found is that deer are basically just goats. And so they'll, they'll graze and they will try things and then they'll move on if they didn't like it, you know? So for the most part, everything in here is deer resistant, meaning uh, it may get nibbled on, but it won't be destroyed or eaten completely by deer or rabbit. So good question, Lynn. Thank you. The American slash purple beauty berry. This is Calicarpa Americana or... Calicarpa dicotoma. So this is in the Lamiaceae family, so this is related to your mints, 
by the way. Um, this plant has an incredible bloom on it um, in the spring of the year that people tend to forget about because of the awesome fruit production later on. But you see that pale lavender bloom up there, if you're paying attention, it's not real big, but if you're paying attention, you will see that bloom. A lot of folks call that insignificant. I disagree. Um, they call it insignificance for aesthetics. I think it's very significant because if you don't miss it, it's beautiful. But if you do miss it, it's key in the fruit production that we see later down. Uh, this is native to Missouri and Southeast United States. Now, when I say native, I'm talking about the Americana, the Calcarpa Americana, or Americana. Um, the dichotoma is technically not native to Missouri, and maybe, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know about Kansas on that one, uh, but it, it, to be honest, it is so hard to tell the difference between the two. I've never had anybody complain yet if they've got um, Amer dichotoma instead of America in there. It is a deciduous shrub, zone 6 to 10 hardy, again, deer resistant on this, um, especially I have found, um, I have some new ones in the landscape. Uh, some deer did try it within the last couple of days and then they moved on. Um, they, they nippled off a little bit of the top and left the, the foliage laying on the ground, meaning they did not like the taste of it. So I don't expect them to be back. I um, mean, they didn't do a lot of damage anyway. Blooms in June, June um, through into August and then the fruit shows up basically in September um, and persist into the winter. Uh, let's see what else. It attracts birds and pollinators, very showy, persistent fruit. And that fruit will hang on, like I said, after the foliage is gone and into the winter. One of the downsides to this plant that has been purported is that um, a lot of folks like to cut the fruit and bring it in for winter displays. And they have had poor luck in doing so in that that fruit will desist immediately and drop off and roll like little purple BBs all over your Thanksgiving centerpiece um, or all over your table. Um, the thing is, if you keep it wet, however, that fruit will stay on. It's the cut and dried that does not work. The color will, will remain on the fruit, uh, but um, it won't hang on to the plant if it's dry. If you put it in a you know vase of water, the color actually hangs on quite well. And you'll see also on there they have white versions of this fruit, um, which can be great in a in a night garden. But I tend to be you know kind of partial to that brilliant purple that you see right there. Excellent plant, absolute excellent plant. I love this in mass. This is not a just one plant kind of thing. This is plant multiples uh, because the show of a mass of these shrubs is absolutely outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Okay. Purple or American Beauty Berry, and I'm okay if you use either one, and if you choose to use the white ones, I understand completely. All right. Next on the list is the butterfly bush, the Budlia davidii. Okay, you have to pronounce both eyes at the end. It's a rule, uh, I guess, David E I. Um, it is a deciduous shrub, but it's one that I put in that um, marginal zone. It could be what I call a woody stem per perennial in that a harsh winter may freeze this off to the ground um, and it has to start over, but it typically does not kill it all the way into the ground or the roots. And it does a really good job of coming back up and blooming on its new wood on there. And I had to get the picture with the monarch, you know, on there because uh, even though the larva doesn't like to eat it, the monarchs love to visit the butterfly bush um, blooms and it, it truly does deserve its name on that. Um, it's in a uh, Scrofulariaceae family. It is on five to nine hardy. Uh, depending on which one you get, if, if, if it's happy and it doesn't get any, you know, winter burning, um, it can get up to eight feet tall um, with a spread of three to five feet. Typically, the cultivars that are in commerce today, however, top out in the four to five foot by same uh, four to five foot on its on its dimensions. This blooms from June, uh, early June, typically into September, maybe even up to the first frost. Um, anywhere in the color schemes from white to purple with pinks all thrown in there, no yellows. Um, that I've seen yet, no true reds, but a lot of almost true blues in there, which is kind of nice. Full sun plant for sure, medium water needs, very easy to take care of this plant. Um, very showy, very fragrant, good cut flower. Uh, tolerates rabbits and deer, no problem. Actually tolerates pretty harsh soil conditions as well. 
There is a map that you see on there with some, um, those are the states in which this plant has made the naughty list. Um, basically, it has a tendency to be a little bit weedy. Um, it does reseed itself if it's very happy. Hasn't been a big problem in Missouri and Kansas, but you can actually, in some, uh, the Northwestern states up there, um, this has made a list of don't use me list up there. And there's some invasive reports in a few other states and even in the South and East too. Lynn, another one? Yes, uh, the butterfly bush becomes a flopper in my garden. Any thoughts? Embrace the flop or don't use it. Um, that's that's my thought on that. Um, there are a few that, that stand up a little bit better. Um, you might try some of the pugsters. They're being a little bit more rigid than that. Um, but they're a, more of a dwarf as well. So that, you know, like kind of laying over is not as big an issue. One thing that I try to avoid, and, and that is what I call the plants in a cage syndrome. Um, I tend to, to use a plant um, and embrace its habit. Um, if I think, if I know a plant flops, I want it to flop and I use it as a flopper. Um, same thing with, with peonies in cages or roses that are being protected from deer. If I have to put a plant in a cage, I'm probably not going to use that plant. You can provide additional support, but to me, I don't think you should have to put extra effort into a plant. So my thought is either don't use it or embrace the fact that it's going to have a flower head that's a little too heavy for it to hold up. And that's and, I'll, and allow it to be that mass of drooping, just like you see in that upper left photo right there. That's, that's a little bit of a flop going on there where those fl heavy flower heads are starting to need the support of the ones below it. And that's, that's basically what's happening in there. So either embrace it or, you know, leave the plant alone. Find a, find a different alternative on that. Next up on the list is the little blue stem. I love this grass. I'm a big fan of this grass. It's native. Uh, to Missouri and Eastern North America. Keep in mind, I'm sorry, I'm a Missouri guy. Um, I know I'm talking to some Kansas folk out there. Um, so, I'll, I'll, you know, I, you guys should be very familiar, however, with a native prairie grass like little blue stem, uh, Schizacrium, Scoparium, a lot of different cultivars available out there. I don't care if you use a straight species or a native var, so to speak. Um, very, very excellent grass to use, multi seasons of interest on that. Um, it's a foliage for me. It blooms from August to February, but its seed head or its bloom is not the most attractive part. It's this bluish green foliage that it has that turns a little bit of crimson. And you have um, excellent um, winter interest with this as well. Uh, three to nine hardy without any problem, up to four feet ish tall, uh, about a two foot spread for each clump. Um, purplish bronze color um, in the winter. Full sun plant for sure. Requires very little extra water. Um, great naturalizing this in mass. Um, very good summer through winter interest on that. The biggest problem with this, with using grasses of any kind, is that period of time um, when you decide winter interest is done and you have to get the old foliage out of the way of the new stuff. And, you know, if you've got a large mass of it, you could try burning it. I find that it's a little bit safer uh, to come through and use head shears basically and cut them off about six inches above the ground, get the old foliage out of the way so the new foliage can come in and be beautiful. On that, um, it's very tolerant of deer, drought, erosion, dry soil, shallow, rocky soil, um, no issues, actually can grow underneath a black walnut, which not a lot of things can, pollution tolerance. This is an outstanding grass. Um, this is one of the things that were in the original uh, Maloney garden design and it did not get removed or hindered in any way, not relocated or anything. In fact, um, when I expand, it will be in the expansion as well. So little blue stem, fantastic grass, fantastic grass. Probably my favorite, favorite of the native grasses. Uh, Tim? Can yes. you be more specific in the idea of mass plantings of this grass? Yeah, so mass plantings, basically um, in this, um, plant them on two to three foot centers in groups of anywhere from five to 25. Uh, but putting this in, in as far as, you know, I kind of do what I call a checkerboard or staggered planting where it's, uh, you know, in and out type of planting on there, splitting the gaps. I plant these to where they will grow together. 
And that's what I'm looking for with a mass of plants is I'm looking for very little gap between the foliage, between plants. Um, you can, I plant these on, like I said, two to three foot centers, but you could plant these as close as 18 inches on center. You just get that full mass effect a little bit quicker that way. Is that what we're going for, Lynn? Yes, I think so. Okay, good. Yeah, these as these are okay as a specimen plant. I've seen them used in containers as specimen, and it can be fantastic um, because they've got a lot of support around them. But this plant is striking when it's got numbers. You know, a significant amount of, of like species in there is fantastic. And I'll tell you, I I'm, I hate ice storms. Don't like them at all. Uh, but if they're going to have one, uh, coating these plants with ice in the winter, um, it, it's like a little crystal garden, and it can be really pretty impressive in there. All right, this is the orange rocket barberry, and honestly, there are a lot of cultivars of Barberis thunbergi that have been popular for quite a while. Um, it's in the Barberidaceae family, a native to Japan. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a Japanese barberry. Orange rocket is a cultivar that's come up that has been it, it just kind of struck my fancy a little bit. It's tall and narrow. Um, it gets, you know, up to six feet tall, um, four to seven foot spread, but at, in its youth, it's probably only about a four foot spread on there. Um, I like the vertical lines that it gives, and it's a brilliant orange color on there. Now, Barbaris thunbergi, you see that map. I had to bring the map up there. I mean, some of these children misbehave, and depending on where you are, they can do so in a bad way. We have... Um, well, basically a lot of these plants that have a tendency to move beyond where we want them produce a little red berry. And I call them the, you know, the unauthorized, well, it's the Department of Unauthorized Forestry. Um, that's the birds that come in and eat those little red berries and decide to put them in other places. Uh, Missouri and Kansas, it does not, it has not shown any signs of being invasive, um, but with the climate constantly changing, who knows? So you might want to use them, you know, be mindful of that. Another downside to this plant is that barb part of barb berry in there. Um, it is it is one that is not, um, <laughs> not fun to prune or maintain. Um, and so I typically put these in places where they can grow and, and be themselves and not require a whole lot of maintenance along with them. And you could you know, broaden it beyond orange rocket and go into the crimson pygmy or the crimson pygmy nana, which is the dwarf dwarf Japanese, uh, rosy glow. Um, there's a lot of the Japanese barberry that that um, can provide that summer foliage. The other thing about this, we have an adage in the landscape business, and that is, if a barberry dies there, nothing will grow. Nothing will grow in a place if a barberry cannot live. It it will survive in the worst possible situations. It's incredible um, what they can tolerate on that, which is partially also probably um, indicative of the fact that it's spreading all over, especially the eastern part of the United States. And, and to be honest, um, they wouldn't surprise me if an update to that 2018 map you see there doesn't show some issues in the in a little bit further west than what we see it now too. So just be mindful. Endless summer, big leaf hydrangea, the macrophylla. Um, endless summer, and then there's been some new um, derivations of it. The twist and shout is one um, <clears throat> that is more of a lace cap uh, rendition of the endless summer. But this is, um, uh, most, believe it or not, most people, when they tell me they want hydrangeas in the landscape, this is what they want right there. Um, it blooms on new wood, which is good because it is in that marginally hardy zone. Um, if it freezes back, it'll it'll come back and it will bloom on the new wood. Now that blooming may be delayed a little bit. We talk about May to July on that. If you get a total freeze back, it may be more like July to August in bloom or maybe even starting in late July. And I've even on mine personally, I've had the bloom start so late that they lasted about a week before frost. So you, you gotta be, you know, understand that you may get something here that's a little bit tender. Um, this one requires afternoon shade. You cannot put a, you cannot put this or to be honest with you, most hydrangeas I think should be put in an area protected from afternoon sun. Um, 
blooms pink to it blues to pinks to whites on here. Uh, typically, if you see the pinks in there, it's a soil chemistry thing. You can get more of the blue by adding some like ammonium sulfate, something like that to the soil. Um, it'll, it'll help quite a bit. Um, yeah, uh, just a, a good classic blue to pink blooming shrub in the shade on that. But a lot of people love this plant. Uh, you know, six to 10 feet tall, about the same spread. Realistically, not going to happen here because we have some winners um, that'll knock it back. But you're probably looking at about a five to six foot height and spread on that. I, I think medium water needs um, is, is giving it the benefit of the doubt. It has high water needs more shade you're in, the better off you're going to be. But this prefers to be in a regularly irrigated situation, to be honest. Um, this is one of those plants that starts whining very quickly um, and decides to let you know that it needs water in a hurry. On that. Yeah, this is the Endless Summer Big Leaf Hydrangeas. And this, this little, little participant in the garden is, has come on strong. Uh, this is an attempt for the plant breeding industry to get aronia or chokeberry back into our landscapes. And they developed one that um, basically melanocarpa gets up to six feet tall and spread. Low scape mound tops out at about 18 inch by 18 inch. This is a little shrub cover, almost a ground cover on that. A light bloom, a good fall color, and then good summer fruit. And that, that white bloom is basically in May. So, you know, late spring, early summer, and then that fruit comes on in July and August, um, and it kind of has that blueberry. It's in the rosaceae family, so it's technically a little rose hip or a little apple, um, but it kind of has the texture of a blueberry. It is edible. It's actually apparently good for us. Um, apparently, it is an outstanding antioxidant. Um, however, I'm not a fan of the flavor. Um, I'm not a fan of bitter, and it's got a real bitter, bitter tone to it. So I'm not a big fan. Now, I know people will make like aronia jelly or chokeberry jelly, uh, but if you add enough sugar to any fruit, you can make a jelly out of it, I think. But this is um, a really cool little plant. Um, it has some behavioral issues as well. Um, it, here's, here's the term. It's a colonizer. It's not invasive. And it's actually the melanocarpa is considered a native in our in our neck of the woods. So honestly, it's not considered a bad thing if it spreads beyond by birds or whatever, but it doesn't stay put in the landscape. This is one of those that you need to understand how it's going to grow. It colonizes, it sends out runners. Um, and so it's reseeds and sends out runners. And so it is a shrub cover, it's a ground cover. Um, and be prepared for it to be a ground cover. It's excellent for bank stabilization, but if you want to keep it as these cute little mounds that don't spread together into a mass, this is not your plant, okay? This is not your plant. Um, this is not gonna stay the cute little hockey puck or meatball. This is going to turn into a gigantic carpet of aronia, which is actually, if you can imagine, a big blanket of that white bloom and then that dark uh, fruit and then that great fall color. It's not a, it's a pretty nice looking blanket, in my opinion. Okay. Next up, we're kind of got another little accent tree, dwarf, you know, small tree slash big shrub slash crazy sculpture in the garden. This is the tiger eye sumac, rust typhina. This is a staghorn type sumac cultivar called bale tiger or tiger eye. A deciduous shrub or tree, it's in the Anacardiaceae family, which by the way, Lynn is the same family, I believe is poison ivy. And that um, it is not, however, poisonous uh, to Well, most. that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, that, it does not have, well, to be honest, cashews are in that family too. So I, you know, and I love cashews. So, but uh, <laughs> it's native to Eastern North America. Actually, the staghorn sumac is native to parts of Missouri and East. Um, it, it blooms from July to August, but nobody really cares. It's that foliage uh, that we see on there, that brilliant um, greenish to yellow. And then in the fall, that actually turns bright orange. And then those blooms become those red clusters of fruit that you see in that top left picture right there. So while the foliage is still brilliant yellow for summer, that root red fruit sits. And so it becomes a great winter interest plant as well. So this is both a summer and winter plant in my book. Um, the biggest problem with this is it does colonize. I mean, you can see in that lower left picture right there, that could have very well been one plant put in and then it sends up a, 
lots of uh, basically root suckers, not a pleasant term, but it's a, a sprout from the roots along the ground. Uh, so it does create these little mini forests of itself. So you have to be, you know, kind of trim those out. By the way, um, I had a gardener do this. I'm not a big fan of the practice, but um, they thought they would get rid of the extra little um, sumac with Roundup that were coming up because they thought they'd reseeded themselves, but it was actually root sports. And if you spray a root sport or sprout with um, Roundup, you're actually going to kill the parent plant. So it's best to use physical means to reduce the suckering of this if you can. The fruit is very showy, great winter interest tree, no deer or rabbit issues whatsoever. Um, can tolerate all kinds of soil, uh, well-drained is best, shallow and rocky is fantastic, can even handle drought in the worst kind of way. So it's a really nice plant. There's three of these made it into the new Mizzou, uh, Maloney landscape this past summer, and I'm excited to see what they're going to do going through. So fantastic plant. Tim, yes, I would have a comment about it. Uh, in our previous place where we lived, we had a landscape done and they put a tiger sumac right next to a dish or close to the, the so I, duplex. Yeah. And, uh, so I had to constantly trim it every year. Right. One of the things with this plant, and this is, this is one of those classic traps, right? Um, this plant is not sold in large specimen landscape sites. It's, it's sold typically in small containers. And so a lot of, even landscape professionals think they're dealing with what is a, a small plant. One of the things to notice on here is the height of 25 feet and the spread of 20 to 30 feet. That's very realistic. Um, and that needs to be understood. Um, and, and this plant needs to be given plenty of room. It needs to stay away from the satellite dishes um, on that. And then also, it typically won't get into power lines, but it could have some issues with eaves and siding as well. Like that picture there on the right, um, they're going to be pruning that off the brick and the windows for quite some time. So you wanna give it a lot of room um, when, you're, when you're doing this. And, it's become a popular accent plant in containers as well um, because of its you know, winter interest in the fruit and then the, the uh, summer foliage. Um, but again, you know, maybe captivity will keep it a little bit smaller, but it can be a very large plant. There's actually, um, there was a, a colony of this planted around a, an entrance bench to the agriculture building here on our campus. And uh, it's, it's now created quite the, quite the ceiling over that bench. So it is, um, it is a grower for sure. All right, now I've gotta, I gotta be honest about this plant. Nandina started a lot higher on the list of summer interest plants for me because of the foliage on there. And to be honest, because of the evil little red fruit that you see there too, it's a beautiful plant. It really is a beautiful plant. And that map, by the way, um, is has probably already grown um, to include some red states and um, the, some of the oranges have turned red down there in the south and there's some expanded on the orange. Uh, basically, the red means that you don't plant it. It's illegal, basically, to plant it. And the orange is shouldn't plant it, um, that it shows inv invasive behavior. This is an invasive plant. Okay. Nandina domestica, you'll hear it called um, heavenly bamboo. It is not a bamboo. It's not a grass at all. It does spread like a bamboo, unfortunately. This is actually closely related to a barberry. It's in the Barberidaceae family. Um, it is native to India, or from India to Japan. Six to nine hardy. Hardiness is not an issue. Uh, it seems to be, I'd say probably five to nine hardy. Um, it's it's pretty tough plant. Three to eight feet, depending on the cultivars in there. Blooms in June. Um, becomes those brilliant red fruits that you see there. Uh, full sun to part shade plant, very easy to take care of. You can use these in mass as a hedge. You can naturalize. Again, um, has showy flower, excellent foliage color, showy fruit. 365 days of interest in one plant. However, it's got serious behavioral issues in that. Um, and this is, the, this is the rough part about this. Those red berries um, do encourage planting by birds. The problem also with that though, is there are some birds that apparently there's enough, if they eat enough of this, there's enough cyanide in that berry to kill a lot of songbirds. And that's become a big, as big an issue for a lot of gardeners as the um, invasive behavior. So I'm also here, I'm gonna provide another list. There is a list, according to Clemson University actually, there are some Nandina varieties that produce little to no fruits whatsoever. 
and they still provide some of the other benefits. So if, if you're writing any of this down and you want to use Nandina, and, and I've limited my use of Nandina to the following, okay? Firepower, this is Firepower Nandina. It's a smaller, um, I'd call it a mid-sized dwarf um, on the Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo, does not produce the fruit. So you lose that winter interest there, but again, these are semi-evergreen plants to evergreen. And that red foliage is year round or, or pretty consistent. Uh, that reddish mottled orange, yellow, greens, all that you see there in firepower is, is very attractive, especially in mass. And you don't have to worry about the fruits of uh, this plant uh, killing or harming any birds or spreading the plant, okay? Gulf Stream is another one, a little bit more on the green side, but a little bit of that red or orange popping in there as more of an accent or a highlight, still a beautiful plant. Uh, but Gulf Stream, a little bit larger than Firepower, but not much. They're both in that same moderate size category, but that's fire, Firepower and Gulf Stream. Firepower top, Gulf Stream bottom. And then we have a true dwarf here. This is called Nana. I'm not a big fan of Nana. I don't use Nana a lot because it's basically just what you see there. It's kind of green. I could get that with a Spirea without any kind of issues at all. The only difference is that it is a, an evergreen broadleaf. So that green would stay on through the winter as well. Uh, this is Woods Dwarf, an interesting plant. It's not as tight a cluster of foliage, a little more open, um, and in a really interesting color palette there, similar to what we see, you know, up there with Firepower, uh, but a little bit more, less of that neon color and a little bit more muted in its greens and burgundies in there. Um, and then uh, this is Sienna Sunrise, a finer texture with a smaller leaf, on there are smaller leaflets on its leaves. Uh, so it creates a little bit finer texture in there. Again, a little bit more muted in its color. And then this one I do really like. This one is, um, this is lemon lime. And lemon lime is that, basically reminds me of a spirea gold mound, but it is again an evergreen. And so those colors will stay on there. So if you want to use an andina and you um, like the foliage color that it provides and everything, it moved down from like somewhere in the, three, four range on my list down to number 10, because part of the reason I love the Nandina is the fruit and I won't plant the fruited type anymore. Um, so these are these are my six usable, in my opinion, in my world anyway, usable Nandina. Um, to be honest, the ones that I don't use are a little bit more my favorites than the ones that I do. So I had to take, I had to knock some of my kids off the list and, and bring in some others in there, but that's the Nandina. All right, now, we just got done talking about summer color, okay? And you cannot, you can't talk about summer color without talking about herbaceous perennial gardens. Um, and that's why I, I didn't focus on them on this discussion. I'm talking to a room full of people that knows all about the Leatris and the Echinacea and the Rubecchia and the Salvia and oh, you name it. Uh, well, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, the, the daisy, you know, Leucanthemums. You know, all of these summer blooms exist without any issue whatsoever. And we have a tendency as gardeners to, to plant a lot of these, okay? And to the point that I've seen some landscapes and gardens that are pretty much all of these. And what I want folks to just remember is that we do move into winter, you know, and, and while there can be some beauty in that, there's also some obvious downtime, okay? It's the sleepy months, right? And so when we move into the winter months, this, you know, becomes this and, and it transitions accordingly. And then at some point we have to wrestle with the decision, okay, when do we go in and remove the old foliage? Um, how do we do it so that we don't disturb the stuff that's nesting in the ground and all this kind of stuff? So that's why I'm focusing a little bit on the woody stems in this conversation. So let's move into the winter, okay? This is Maloney's, not David Letterman's, but L Maloney's top 10 winter color plants. And you'll notice on here, there is some overlap but it's worth, it's worth mentioning some of them again because of the winter interest. 10, Nandina. So you can write these down as we go. We got the Nandina. Number nine is the Mahonia, which are Oregon gray poly. We have the Tiger Eye Sumac, made the list twice, so the Nandina. Purple or American Beautyberry, made both lists. Common Witch Hazel, new. Seven Sunsflower, made both lists. Little Blue Stem, made both lists. Japanese Curia, just the winter list. Vernal Witch Hazel, again, just the winter list. And Winterberry, just the winter list. So let's look at all of these plants again. Some of them a little more closely and provide some winter interest. Look, this is the Winterberry Holly. 
Um, this is Ilex verticillata. Um, unfortunately, although a lot of people think it is, it's not native to Missouri or Kansas. Um, <coughs> excuse me, it is a holly in the Aquafoliaceae plant family, and it is a deciduous shrub. Um, it is native to Eastern North America. It's not native to the Eastern part of Missouri, however, uh, but a lot of folks think it is. Um, the, what they get thrown off with is deciduous holly. Um, Ilex decidua is native to Missouri and Kansas, and it didn't make my winter list uh, because it doesn't fruit enough, okay? It did, it's, it's not as prolific a fruiter. Um, the other reason I like the winterberry holly is because of all of the options available in cultivars. Um, they have a very dwarf manageable, easy, like the red sprite is a Mary Poppins. These are a couple of little dwarf um, holly, winterberry holly, all the way up to stoplight and Maryland beauty and afterglow and you name it. Um, anywhere from orange to red berries, all of varying sizes, um, native from zones three to nine. I'm sorry, hardy from zones three to nine, native, like I said earlier, Eastern North America. Anywhere from three feet to 12 feet, depending on the cultivar, both height and spread. It blooms in June and July, but nobody cares. Um, the leaf is there all, all through the spring and summer. Um, it prefers uh, a little bit of shade maybe, but full sun plant for sure. Um, moderate to moist water needs, very low maintenance requirements. Great as a hedge in mass, even as, if you give the right size, even a specimen plant, no problem whatsoever. It's, birds absolutely love this. It's a great overwintering bird, uh, bluebird plant. Incredible winter fruit display. Tolerates erosion, clay soil, wet soil, and air pollution. And does not prove, has not proven to be invasive, uh, which is also excellent on that. Um, biggest issue with this plant is it is pretty ho-hum from spring through, through late summer, early fall, when the berries start, start showing up. And you can see there we have the berries while there's still leaves on the plant, and then we have the berries when the leaves fall off. So once those leaves evacuate the building, the fruit is much more impressive on there. So um, big fan of Ilex verticillata, and I have used many different cultivars, all with great success. Uh, very tolerant of everything and deer resistant as well, deer and rabbit resistant as well. Uh, so fantastic plan. Vernal witch hazel, vernalis meaning winter, vernal. Um, this is the winter witch hazel. I'm in a Hamamalidaceae family, love saying that word, Hamamalidaceae. A uh, native to Missouri, um, southern central United States. I'm not sure about Kansas, but this is a Missouri native. You see a couple of pictures there. The fall color is on the lower right. The upper is the early spring bloom um, to winter. It blooms from January into April, um, which is really pretty cool. Um, when you, if you on a nice sunny January day look out and you see yellow blooms on one of your small trees slash large shrubs, Beautiful. You, typically a yellow flower, uh, these, these straps, yellow straps with a red inner calyx on it. Uh, again, full sun to part shade. I kind of prefer it in the part shade. Uh, very low maintenance requirements whatsoever. It's great as a naturalizing shrub or a specimen tree, depending on how it's pruned. Very showy, very fragrant, interesting plant. A lot of history behind the witch hazels go way back. Um, the, the old um, profession of water witching where they took uh, stems and they bend toward water when you're looking for wells or places to dig a well. Apparently they use witch hazel for that. And there's a lot of um, medicinal and, you know, there's a fine line between medicinal and narcotic and poison, but there's a lot of medicinal purposes uh, for parts of this plant. So it's, it's been around a long time. Um, it does very well in our area. Um, and I love the fact that this wakes me up early in the in the late winter. Well, I don't know, depending on how late. Typically, I start seeing blooms on mine in February. And I love getting out there, um, and especially if there's a light dusting of snow and seeing light dusting of snow on the blooms. Or even I've seen blooms encased in ice before. So it's a pretty interesting plant. Japanese curia or Curia japonica for my plant ID students. This is one of their favorites because it's both, both it's just backwards um, from Latin to uh, common on that. Deciduous shrub, it's in the Rosaceae family. This is a really uh, pretty phenomenal plant to be honest with you um, in that 
Um, yes, it provides incredible winter interest with those green stems, but the leaf has this incredible texture, uh, heavily serrated leaves on there, a brilliant green color, same color as the stem, and then it blooms. It actually blooms, oh, in April, um, April, early May, late April, early May. Uh, they have their yellow bloom. The one you see in the picture up there is called Plentiflora. That is a double, a cult of double blooming cultivar, um, but they also have the single, which is a little bit more like a composite. Actually, it's a little bit like a, a flat rose bloom on there. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to tell you? Part shade plant, moderate water needs, uh, moderate maintenance requirements, great in hedging or massing or naturalizing. Uh, I will warn you that this is one of those plants that will creep a little bit beyond where you put it. Um, it has a tendency to spread and grow underground. Um, I tend to, if I'm planting this in my own yard, I don't care. I'm planting it in a place where I want it to do that. If I'm planting it in yours, however, I'm going to look for some sort of a physical barrier like driveway or sidewalks or things like that to kind of keep it in, in place. And, and it will. Um, if it, it, it use, doesn't usually creep beyond concrete. So, uh, but it can creep pretty low underground. It's a pretty neat plant. One of the things about Curia though is probably after about five years or so, you want to go in and maybe, maybe every three to five years, go in and, and kind of prune out the, what it, the older wood um, that is becoming less attractive, honestly. And, and it doesn't do anything for the plant other than make it look better to us. And look, little blue stem come back. And I don't need to tell you a lot about it because I've already told you almost everything about it, but I thought I'd show you some pictures of it in the wintertime. Uh, that an upper, upper left picture right there is um, the plant showing its fall color and then moving into its more orangish, rusty colored winter interest, a beautiful plant. Um, again, this is the summer through winter plant. And then we have that, it's not a great spring plant because we have to cut it back and get the old foliage out of the way of the new, but um, it is a really excellent grass to put mass in your landscape. In fact, I would be thrilled if the entire three acre field behind my house was full of little blue stem. So thrilled in fact that when I do cut back that grass, I throw the old stuff out in the field. I'm starting to see it to pop up in there. So I don't know if it'll compete with the fescue or not, but it's starting to get a foothold. Seven Suns Flower Tree that we talked about earlier, that is its winter interest right there. Um, you can tell why, I, why I'm a fan, uh, especially from that picture on the right. That is an older Seven Suns tree um, showing that white flaky bark. That's a beautiful plant. Um, I'm actually uh, getting ready to install low voltage lighting in my garden and uh, there's going to be a spotlight underneath each one of those two seven suns trees because um, in the winter that's going to glow like, well, basically like bone in the landscape. It's absolutely beautiful. So fantastic plant, um, summer and fall and winter on that. Spring's okay. I mean, it, it just, it is getting its green leaves on it right now, but uh, the, the uh, summer and fall and winter months are fantastic for the seven sunflower. All right, common witch hazel, um, just like the vernal witch hazel, it's native. Um, the only difference is this one blooms in the fall. Uh, the downside to that though, is it has a yellow fall color to it and it blooms when the leaves are still on, or at least it starts blooming when the leaves are still on. Um, and so you lose some of the show, honestly. Uh, you lose the bloom in that yellow fall color. And so I actually prefer this plant if we have an early fall and the leaves fall off and it leaves the blooms there. Um, <clears throat> I'm more likely to use the vernal witch hazel just because I don't like the effect that is lost here. But this is a late fall slash early winter bloomer. Um, and again, it's more beautiful once the leaves fall off in late fall. So the common witch hazel. Homomalus virginiana versus Homomalus vernalis. Next up, we've got the purple and American beauty berry again, and this is just showing its late fall slash winter interest once the leaves fall off and maybe even a little ice and snow on it. Beautiful plant. Those purple berries, once those leaves are gone, really show up. It reminds me a lot of a plant I had growing up in the Ozarks. It just grew wild in the woods, and we called it um, buckbrush, but it had more of a kind of a rose colored fruit to it. Um, it's very similar in growth to that, um, but this is again a Lamiaceae, it's in the mint family. Um, it will grow, it'll spread. And, and this has made its way into it, its 
the new learning landscape, uh, several areas have been predisposed to become a thicket or a hedge or a mass of, actually I use the American Beautyberry as I was trying to, I'm also, I've got a little goal in mind of showing folks what, uh, what color we can get out of native plants, um, just because a lot of folks think they're limited in, in native plant color and they're not. Yeah. Tiger eye sumac, again, showing me fall in the upper right and then the winter interest. And I love that bluebird uh, advertising. It's it's another nature of this plant. It's a great overwintering bluebird plant. Has that red fruit on there and those fuzzy stems. So has a really cool, and by the way, that's that planting I was talking about there at the Ag Building that has now grown to provide quite a ceiling, <coughs> excuse me, over that bench. So anyway, that is a tiger eye sumac. And just like Lynn indicated earlier, this thing can get pretty large. Mahonia repens or aquafolium. These are the Oregon gray polys or their creeping mahonia, you name it. Um, <clears throat> the mahonia repens is actually the creeping mahonia. Mahonia aquafolium is the Oregon gray poly. Um, the difference is in the shape of the leaf. If you look at that upper left, you'll see a more rounded leaf. And then in that mid and lower left, you see more of a holly-shaped leaf. Um, other than that, they're almost identical. They have that brilliant yellow bloom that you see in the spring, and then we get that summer blue fruit that you see in the middle. But then, primary reason why I like this plant is the lower left. That is the fall color turning kind of crimson in color and persisting, hanging on all winter long. Very, very a fun plant. Um, if you use the creeping mahonia, the one on the upper left, you're going to get a massive shrub ground cover type of effect. The Oregon grape poly gets a little bit more height to it. Um, you know, the creeping mahonia gets up to one foot. The aquafolium is going to be more like two or three, uh, but they still create quite the coverage in there. It is a marginally hardy plant. And what happens is, uh, typically this happens in early spring here in Columbia, and I like to use these on the east or north side of structures to kind of keep them dormant a little bit longer. But if we get an early warm up, juices start flowing, the plant thinks it's time to wake up and then we get that uh, late freeze, it will cause a little bit of leaf scorch on these plants. They typically outgrow it and recover quite nicely, but you can get a little bit of leaf scorch if you're not careful in the late spring. Well, late freeze in the early spring. So. Uh, but I love the contrast of colors of that yellow bloom and that dark foliage and then those grape-like fruits that come on pretty nice as well. Oregon grape poly or creeping mahonia. And then move to the bottom of the list again are the Nandinas. Um, and you notice two of the photos on here are plants that have fruit and that's because I do prefer the fruited ones in the winter time. But you can see in that upper right that uh, the foliage is evergreen. And when it turns its red fall, well, its red color um, typically intensifies in the fall and it will cling on to that all winter long before the green starts to creep back in in the spring of the year. And so it can be a beautiful winter plant even without the fruit. Remember the non-fruiting varieties are Firepower, Gulfstream, Nana, Woods Dwarf, Sienna, Sunrise, and Lemon Lime. So those are your non-fruiting type. All right, so. We are getting close to the end of the presentation. So I'm just going to let you know, again, remind you that spring and fall are easy. You're on your own. Yeah, you can do this, all right? Um, no problem whatsoever. And quite frankly, you probably don't need my help with the herbaceous stem plants anyway. In fact, I probably would ask you more questions than you would ask me. So, Lynn, that pretty much wraps up what I have to talk about today. Well, we had uh, just a... Another comment, uh, winterberry holly, you can keep it uh, to four feet by four feet by pruning. Yeah, well, yeah, we can actually, the thing that's really cool about plants is you can keep keep them whatever size we want. I, I have adopted a, a mentality toward plants and it, it took me a while, to be honest. Um, the plants are better if we let them do what they're going to do and provide room for them to do it. So if I want a plant that's, you know, four foot by four foot in the deciduous holly, I'm going to go with red sprite or Mary Poppins. But if, if uh, I have more room than that, I might go with Maryland Beauty. Now, I'm not going to put the Maryland Beauty or the Afterglow in a spot that I need a plant four by four. Every time we prune something off of a plant, we're cutting away energy. 
um, nutrients that have been transferred from the ground and into it. So I tend to lean toward putting plants in places where I don't have to manipulate them. So, and, and it's, it's part of it is just uh, laziness, to be honest with you. I don't want to work with those plants um, and, and do all that unnecessary maintenance. I love working in my garden, uh, but I want, I want to do stuff because I want to, not because I have to. And so I tend to, to uh, you know, put plants in that'll stay where I want them.